I guess we'll call our meeting to order. We're at 10 o'clock and uh, all our members are here and one's just on his way in. So, uh, okay, uh, so today we're here for meeting number five of our Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability. And uh, we've got uh, some presenters here today. We have actually two presenters. So I'm going to ask somebody to uh, approve uh, the agenda. Everybody has a copy of the agenda. So uh, approved by Jamie. And uh, I'll just give a brief synopsis of what our standing committee is all about. So sometimes I guess our ratings are going up these days, so we get a lot of people following, so we want to make sure that they know what we're talking about here. So the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability is charged with matters concerning agriculture, fisheries, land, water, forest, wildlife, energy, natural resources, environment, climate change, and other such matters relating to natural resources and environmental sustainability. And today we have actually representatives of the Department of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action on the current state of the province's forests, uh, Norbert Carpenter and Kate McQuarrie. And uh, as we uh, get going here, I'll introduce our members here too. So we have uh, Gord McNeely, who's uh, filling in for Hal Perry. We have Peter Bevan Baker, Carla Bernard, Helton McLennan, and Jamie Fox. And we have some uh, other uh, associate members, uh, Susie Dillon and Bradley Trivers. So the only little rule that we try to have here is uh, to try to make sure that for our audio component to identify yourself when you're speaking, especially when we have more than one member here. So. Either if you uh, start uh, to answer a question or things of that nature, just identify your name first, or I'll have to kind of intervene to do that just so our audio people can tell the difference between who's uh, speaking. So, so anyway, so I'm going to hand it over to, uh, I'll start with Norbert, I guess, and you can introduce yourself and your, uh, your contemporary here for, uh, to present. And if you have a presentation, we can go through that. And if there's questions at the end, uh, or however how you want to do it. If you want to have questions as we go through, we can... Uh, entertain that as well. So, Norbert Carpenter, you're the Deputy Minister for Environment. Sure. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to all the committee members. And uh, good morning, and uh, I want to thank you for the invitation for us to be here today to present. Um, today, I am fortunate to have Kate McCory with me, who's the Director of Forestry, Fish, and Wildlife, and she will do a presentation on the state of the forest in Prince Edward Island uh, related to post tropical storm Fiona. Um, I do want to delineate the fact that this report and the presentation today is the impacts of the storm, where we are, what's happened, and what's happening next. There is a broader and wider report that will be out uh, in the coming weeks on the state of the forest, which is uh, uh, obligatory for us to do every decade. Um, that report is delayed uh, by about a year. Um, there were some issues with the contractor, uh, with the aerial uh, photography, uh, aerial photography that was taking place uh, following uh, for, uh, for the report, which was a major part of the report. Uh, once those issues were rectified, uh, we got back on course, and that will be out in the coming weeks. We're just putting the finishing touches on that. So I just want to be clear about that. Uh, this is related to uh, the damage uh, with Fiona, uh, where we are now, and uh, where we're heading. So I will turn it over to Kate now for the presentation, and we'll be here for questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And Kate McCory, Director of Forest, Fish and Wildlife for Department of Environment, <laughs> Energy and Climate Action. Can our audio folks hear me okay if I sit here? You good? Good. Awesome. Fantastic. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, our forest post Fiona, starting with what we know and how we know it, uh, what we're doing about it, and what our plans are coming up. So in terms of what we know, we know it from our post-hurricane satellite imagery. So immediately following the storm last year, uh, we commissioned full provincial coverage of satellite imagery at a resolution of 50 centimeters per pixel. Uh, there were 16 images in total, and I'll show you those in a moment. Originally, four of those 16 images, when we got into the analysis, we found that we could not use uh, because of some high haze on either end of the province and some snow cover in the highlands of central PEI. You may recall last November we had some early snow. So we had to recommission those in June and July of this year. And we used a combination of uh, computer learning through object-based image analysis, OBIA, as well as human manual delineation of those. So just very briefly, and I caution that I'm not the technical person, but I have staff who are. Who are. Um, the object-based image analysis trains a computer program. In this case, we're using Trimble eCognition to differentiate among land types. 
So if you can see the, the photo uh, on the left-hand side there, I think all of us as humans can identify what's standing forest, what's blowdown, what's road, what's building. And what we're using is through multiple iterations of training a computer to recognize those in a similar way to, to we do in terms of how it looks, what the reflectivity looks like. So delineating forest in the middle area, those are the green polygons or the green shapes. The blowdown is the red. And then combining all of those uh, into polygons to delineate blowdown. So that's the object-based image analysis. Uh, nine of the 16 areas were done that way. The remaining areas, we weren't getting the quality we wanted from the computer model, so that was done by staff through manual delineation. And the OBIA, the object-based image analysis, all had quality control as well, so not relying just on the computer output. So there were 16 images that came through the satellite imagery, and you can see those here. And I think you can see the differences among them in terms of color, reflectivity. So each individual sheet, we had to retrain the computer model to identify the differences between standing forest, fallen forest, and other land types. The outcome, you can see here when it's pasted all together, the green areas are forest, the red areas are blowdown. Uh, and no huge surprise, that swath through uh, eastern Queens County and western Kings County is the most heavily affected. And I'll get into that in a bit more detail. So province-wide, our estimate is about 13% of forests were affected, and that's about 34,300 hectares. And when I say affected, it doesn't mean that every tree within those polygons, within those areas, was blown down, but the majority were. So they were the heavily affected areas. And as we know, the eastern part of the province was most heavily affected with approximately 18% of the area, forest area, 12% in central, 5% in western. Individual areas, of course, tremendous range. So 1.6%, uh, uh, you can see map sheets 5 and 6 there. In the East Prince region, uh, the blowdown was about 1.6% there. Up along the North Shore, and I know you've all seen images and toured through close to 30% along that North Shore area. We're starting to get into some more analysis in terms of the details of which stand types were affected. And right now we can say that there were no differences in the impacts on hardwood versus softwood. They were affected pretty well equally all around that 13%. So what are the, some of the things that we've been doing? Uh, and of course our work with Fiona started immediately, literally the day after the storm, in getting out and looking at some of our public lands. A combination of my staff going out and visiting those sites, We've got drone technology, so using that to make the work safer and more effective. And our priority is public safety. Public safety is always the number one priority in what we do. So looking at uh, reducing fuel load, reducing fire risk in areas, um, ensuring safe public access along access points, um, and salvaging value. And all of those things pointed to salvaging our soft wood blowdown first, which is where the focus has been. Within weeks of the storm, we had 23 uh, priority sites, tenders out for 23 priority sites. Um, and I suspect you don't know the tender process within government, but suffice to say that getting that out within weeks is a significant accomplishment, and I commend my staff for being able to do that. We also had to turn our attention to two urban natural areas, Royalty Oaks and the former community of East Royalty, and of course Beach Grove in Charlottetown, um, for public safety issues as well. So to date, we've managed to salvage about 244 hectares of public land. The West still does have a few more sites to salvage, but it's getting tidied up again. That was much less affected than the East. The East was much harder hit. We estimate about 1.5% of the public lands have been salvaged so far. We have about 10% assessed with plans in place as to what we need or should do there and another 15% assessed and plans in development, figuring out what's the best way to go. So a point to note is traditionally with tenders on public lands, those are revenue generators for the province we're selling wood. In this case, we're often getting negative tenders coming back, that there's a cost associated with this. And as of today, to date, our estimated net cost is about $340,000, so costs over revenue associated with this work on public land. Some other things that we've been doing in terms of public safety and being good neighbors um, is working to assess fire risk on public lands in proximity to buildings. So the image that you see there in the middle is a block of public land. 
We've delineated 50 meters around every block of public land in the province and identified any infrastructure within there. And in total, there were about 1,100 buildings, 1,099, I guess, if you want to be exact, about 1,100 buildings that were identified. For each of those buildings, we identified a 50 meter buffer around it, and our provincial crews have gone into these areas to apply fire smart principles. If you're not familiar with Fire Smart, I encourage you to check out Fire Smart Canada. Fire Smart is an international program that helps individual landowners and communities to reduce uh, fire risk around their homes and structures. So we've been applying those principles, uh, and not just for Fiona damage. If we've identified other issues that could be fire risks, applying Fire Smart principles around all of those buildings, and that work is, if not complete, is very close to complete now. On private lands, uh, in December of last year, we introduced a salvage incentive, recognizing that there are increased costs of doing business associated with salvaging this wood. Um, in last fiscal year, so between the hurricane and March, we, 160 hectares were salvaged, and an additional 300 hectares has been salvaged this year, with an average cost of $1,140 per hectare. If you were to extrapolate that to the entire area of blowdown, the cost would be $39 million at that rate. Uh, just last week, we was pleased to announce um, funding from ACOA to help with some areas that aren't covered under the Forest Enhancement Program. Um, so we recognize that forestry roads are not something that we have any funding for within our programs, but absolutely trees are blown down over forestry roads, and if you can't access these sites, you can't implement sustainable management on these sites, reduce fire risk, and those sorts of things. So really pleased to get that program up and going, running. Uh, and the other part of that is for small woodlots. So in order to access our forest enhancement program, you need a woodlot of a particular size. We recognize that there are smaller woodlot owners, especially on the outskirts of communities, um, that also need some assistance. And so this program is open to them. Some other work that's been ongoing, and really since 2017, We've been working on expanding our forest fire fleet, replacing trucks, both our water tanker fire trucks as well as our off-road muskeg equipment uh, and the trailers that haul those. Uh, we've been upgrading our equipment um, and increasing the number of trained personnel, and this has been stepped up this year with some uh, significant financial investment in that in the current fiscal. The Smart Fire Smart program I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been rolling that out. Uh, we hired a Fire Smart ambassador this year, so we have a person specifically dedicated to that that's been working with communities, with landowners, getting these messages out across Prince Edward Island, and I'm hoping to expand that next year. I really commend my staff for work, reaching out to the volunteer fire departments. Um, reaching out on a one-on-one -on -one basis to hear what folks' concerns are, what are the barriers, what can we do to help. We provided fire suppression training to all forest contractors on PEI who were interested. So we offered a session and many of them came into that. Again, just increasing first responder ability and having those skills more widely distributed in the forest sector. We provided free chainsaw safety training uh, to landowners. Of course, and I'm sure many folks in this room were in the same boat. Um, immediately after the hurricane, there's deadfall and falls, hurricane blown, blow down on your property. Um, that you may want to clean up personally and not have the chainsaw skills to do it. So the purpose of the chainsaw safety training was twofold, was to provide basic skills, but also to provide information on when you really need a professional, because we're very nervous about having newly trained people tackling things that are beyond their abilities. Um, an expansion of our two billion tree program that I know you've all heard about to include hurricane damage sites. During Hurricane Fiona, we were in the final stages of preparing our proposal uh, to the federal government for two billion trees. It was to have included expansion creation of new forests on unforested land, and we very quickly pivoted to include uh, replanting hurricane damage sites where needed. So next steps, what's, what's coming up? Um, in terms of the post-hurricane analysis, uh, there are, is some more information that I want from that that we'll be getting in terms of what forest communities were most affected. We know where the blowdown was. We know it was equally distributed between hardwoods and softwoods. For planning purposes, I want information on which forest communities were affected. 
was, uh, you know, larch and poplar in Prince County more effective than upland hardwoods in Queens County versus Kings County? Those sorts of things help with forest management planning. I want to know what other factors were significant. And anecdotally from driving around, my staff and I can certainly see that edge and aspect were two things that were significant. Had the wind come from the south rather than the north, the result would have been different. The individual site-specific results would have been different. Uh, and again, soils play a role in that as well. Had we been hit in those wetter areas of Prince County, the results would have been different. Um, the State of the Forest report that um, the deputy mentioned that we'll be coming out with has information on wood supply and carbon budget modeling, and obviously some adjustments will be needed to be made to those based on the impacts of Fiona. But there are some longer-term planning questions, and I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that some of these bigger picture things that we just kind of woke up on September 24th and said, wow, I guess we should think about this. In our, my division, we've been working on this stuff for a long time. And things like how can forest management increase <coughs> forest resilience? Um, uh, there's been a lot of focus on, on species selection, and species selection is absolutely important, but it's not the only factor. So species selection, um, there are some tree species that will do better than others under the projected climate scenarios. However, unfortunately, some of those species are also going to be preferentially targeted by insect pests that will also do better under climate scenarios. Two examples, uh, red oak and white ash, are both projected to do very well under our changing climate. I love those trees. I'm happy that they're going to do well. Unfortunately, uh, there's a disease called oak wilt that's been marching north. It was first discovered in Canada this summer for the first time. Emerald ash borer is on our doorstep in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So it's not just a matter of what species will do well, but what species don't have pests and disease associated with them. It, it, it is complex, and I'll get into that a bit more in a moment. Um, what silvicultural treatments can we apply to help make our, our um, forest more resilient? And something that I think is really important is landscape level planning. So traditionally, forests have been managed at a stand level, so a particular group of trees that has a common trait, or at a property level. I think if we're serious about increasing resilience, it needs to be, we need to manage at a larger landscape level. Looking at what that means, how that can be done, in Prince Edward Island, where we have 16,000 individual private woodlot owners and a very fragmented landscape. How do we involve landowners and industry is a big question for, for my division and my staff. So industry are critical partners in delivery of forest management of Prince Edward Island. We cannot do what we need to do without industry, and we need to find ways uh, to support them. Um, most of our forest work right now occurs outside of the public program, so outside of our forest enhancement program, so outside of government in influence. Um, over the fall, we're taking a very serious look at how we can work more closely with our industry partners and what barriers may exist and how we can um, help them address the issues that are priorities, rec recruitment, retention, succession, as well as just day-to-day -day management. Of course, there are bigger questions that are outside my division, but are, of course are, are inside of the purview of the folks in this room, are the other changes that we're dealing, looking at provincially in terms of population increase. What will that mean for our forests? Munici municipal govern governance, will municipalities have say over what happens in the forests within their boundaries? And if so, what does that look like? Um, and land use planning, and, and can land use planning resolve some of the challenges faced by competing goals. So if we look at increasing population, we want to increase forest area. That's something my, my division wants to do. Um, we want to maintain agricultural land. We want to increase protected area. How do we achieve all of those goals? And hopefully land use planning will provide some tools to do that. We're trying to do the best we can in a really complex environment, both figuratively and literally. Um, so our forests, of course, forests are tremendously complex. It's not simple growing trees, right? So all of the things that I put in that bubble there, uh, you know, I could have filled it up with a hundred different things, but forests are complex. Climate is complex, right? And again, I could have put a hundred different things in that bubble. We've got, you know, uh, extreme weather, precipitation, pests, invasive species, they interact with each other, and all of those things interact with forests. And layered on top of that, of course, are socioeconomic factors and expectations, right? So our economic revenue generation that we get from the forest, the forest products that we all want and need and that are fantastic, population, workforce, 
all of those sorts of things. Um, so just to say that all of these things are complex in and of themselves, and when they interact, which they do in the planning world that we're doing, the complexity multiplies exponentially. So with that, I will stop my rambling, Mr. Chairman. And Okay, well, thanks very much, Kate. Actually, I, I'm quite impressed with the fact that you do, do take into so many factors because it is very complex uh, from what I see just from my own woodlot. Uh, okay, we have some questions lined up. So I have Gord, Jamie, and Peter on the uh, docket at the moment. So I'll start off with Gord. Oh, thank you very much for coming in. And, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously some good news in the planning department, but you know, like some bad news for the things that happened to our forests. And um, um, I guess with the... Um, the state of the forest report, and that being delayed one year, and it's a 10-year, like you said, it's 10 years, and we, we've talked about that a lot in here. Um, what are you, I guess, how much did, did Fiona set you back? And it just, it seems like if it's 10 years, you know, like, are we, are we going to get a lot of information from this report? We're, we're, it's delayed one year. It's a ten-year report. I mean, it's it's hard to say. Okay, if you want to hit, then I'd understand it being delayed. But would that have report have been out on time without Fiona? Can we do that, or do you do? Norbert Carpenter. Uh, thanks for the question, Norbert Carpenter. Um, uh, the unfortunate part about that, Fiona came, uh, and that's not going to be reflected in that report. Uh, so I think that's what you're getting at. I don't think Fiona itself, uh, and, and Kate can jump in on that, would have impacted the timelines. As I said earlier, there was an issue with the contractor that was involved. Um, will the report be useful? Absolutely. Uh, I was briefed on the contents of the report. There's lots of great information in there. Many of Many of the aspects that Kate refers to in the complexity Venn diagram she had uh, will be highlighted in that report. Uh, but in terms of uh, Fiona specific things, um, I don't think that will be reflected in the report. But I'll turn that over to you, Kate. No, and, and Kate McCorry. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, no, Fiona didn't impact the timing of the report. Um, the impact was due to an out of province third party contractor responsible for the aerial photo interpretation. The interpretation product was due to us in August of 2022. In August of 2022, we were advised it would be December. In November of 2022, we were advised it would be February. By March of 2023, the contractor had still not completed the contract, so we terminated it and completed it in-house. So the delay was, that was what caused the delay, and that was independent of Fiona. Do you have a follow-up question to that, uh, Gord? Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, that's got to be frustrating because the only thing I look at is I hope the report didn't, if you're waiting for something, you know, that might speed up the work or make the work a little bit, you know, rushed, or, so to speak, and I hope that didn't happen. But um, the other kind of question, I guess what, what I think about too is, um, you know, forest fire risk. And we had your minister in this legislature talk about, um, it was baffling, actually, talked about um, the, the fire at Crowbush. And I mean, like, global, we know what, what the media was, what would happen with fires in our country. And, and he said, the, the fire at Crowbush, he said, if the winds were blowing in another direction, we could have lost half of eastern Prince Edward Island. Um, I, I, I don't know if that particular, I, I, it was very baffling in here when he said that. But can you comment on that? Are we ready in terms of, that's just a little sample shot of what happened in Prince Edward Island. Those comments were made. Was he accurate with those comments? Robert Carpenter. Thank you for the question. Um, that would predate my time here, but uh, I'm not sure uh, the context of the question that he was asked or whether that was just a, a comment that he made. Um, certainly concerning. We were all very concerned when we heard about that and we knew there was lots of fuel on the ground after Fiona. Uh, I can't comment on whether that was accurate or, or not, um, but I will say, uh, based on what I've been seeing and submissions to the capital budget, there is a focus on uh, fire suppression and, and dealing with forest, fire, forest fires in the province. Um, but I'll open it up to Kate if you have anything to add. No, uh, the only thing I'd add is in terms of fire preparedness, our ability to respond right now is at an all-time high, and uh, I'm very confident in that. Okay, I'm going to go now. Just to remind the honourable members here, this that, that really wasn't a follow-up question; that was a separate oh, question. But uh, 
But anyway, I didn't intervene on that. But uh, Jamie Fox. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kate Norbert, for coming in today. Um, good to see us. Um, I'm really interested in what we're doing for reforestation and replanting. Because I've been saying for years, I don't think we do enough of it. But I know the nursery is limited on the amount of trees that you can produce. Can you expand on that? And what are we doing to get more trees out the door and in the ground? Do you want to take that? Yep. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. I appreciate that. Kate um, McGuire. <laughs> it's hard to remember to do that. I know, I know. <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah, so one of the exciting things right now is through the, the Two Billion Tree Program that is cost-shared with the Government of Canada, and we are expanding our tree production by 30% under that to 1.3 million trees. Um, the, we're doing, uh, I, I guess, a couple of things. Um, looking to increase the hardwood component because I know there's uh, demands from my forest technicians on our own properties as well as from our private landowners for increased hardwood species. So looking at ways that we can do that uh, and looking at increasing our forest area provincially as well through that two billion tree program. So through marginal areas um, that just are, really aren't economically effective to farm to bringing some of those marginal lands back into forest cover and expanding our forest cover provincially. So I guess the short answer, that was a long way of saying mm -hmm. we're increasing our production by 30%. Um, th those trees will be seeded in 2024 for planting in 2025, and we're prepared to expand beyond that if need be. Jamie Fox, follow up? Or? Thanks, Chair. So with that, it's my understanding that the province of New Brunswick offered a lot of trees to be replanted in PEI or to have access to, but that was not followed through on. There was no, the government did not take advantage of that offer. Is I that don't, true? I don't know anything about that offer. I'm sorry, that offer was, I have no knowledge of that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, uh, Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you, Chair. I uh, really appreciate you both being here. Thank you. For, and, and, a lot of really interesting, important information uh, already given this morning. Uh, one of the things that sort of astonished me was that we could cover the whole island at a resolution of 50 centimeters a pixel with just 16 images. I mean, that's amazing. Who, who out there is providing us with that level of satellite imagery? The, the company that Kate provided McCoy. it, oh, Kate McCoy. <laughs> the company that provided it was MDA. Um, I know that's who we had the contract with, and I can get you more information on the specifics. I'm I'm not the technical person in my division. My staff, if they're listening, are laughing now. So, <laughs> Peter Redenbaker. Um Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, related to the images, and um, we saw them there, and the and the sort of uneven distribution of the damage that Fiona did across the island, which I, you know. We're aware of that. Uh, but you mentioned, I think, that 13% were affected. And by that, you meant <coughs> more than 50% blow down. Is that? Yeah, I would say more than 70% blow down. Oh, OK, yeah. OK. And then you went on to say that on public land, we've salvaged about 1.5% of that affected. That's just in the Eastern District. Just in the Eastern District. Yeah. Do we have any figures for the private land, which is, of course, a much, much larger acreage? What percentage of, of private acreage which suffered that sort of degree of blowdown has been salvaged? So the only number Kate we McCoy. the only number we would have is the um, the area that was salvaged through our forest enhancement program, and I had given that in the presentation there. Um, there is, I'm sure, salvage work going on outside our program, and we would have no way of knowing about that. <coughs> So I, I can't answer the, your question. The only number I can give you is what's gone through our program. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, Hilton McClellan. Do you want to back on, Peter? Yeah, please. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Um, one question on um, how did, like, losing these trees, how does it affect the wildlife? Has it changed the wildlife of PEI? Kate McCory, great question. There, did I jump in? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I like the I like the term change rather than sort of harm because in terms of the wildlife, uh, it's been negative for some things and positive for others. So I'm thinking of things um, things like snowshoe hare and rough grouse, um, just as two simple examples. Um, are going to love this. Their food is now within reach. They've got lots of cover, um, protection from predators, fantastic. 
um, some of the predators, so some of the birds that might, and mammals that may, might be chasing them, are going to have a little bit of a harder time because their prey is, is harder to get at now. Um, so benefits for some things, detriments for others, but the good news story there is that our wildlife are so adaptable um, that it's not a, a provincial-wide effect or provincial-wide detriment to any species. Um, things will move around, things will adapt, and uh, that, that's one of the bright lights I see is in the wildlife and how they're adapting to the change. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Follow-up question on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, Susie, you have a follow-up question on that specific topic? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intervene and I'll allow you to have that question. Well, um, given that I live in the city, uh, we've seen an uptake on rabbits and Either skunks okay. and raccoons, and I wonder if that's being affected because of uh, the massive amounts of forestry that's down and maybe they don't have as many places to live, but foxes would be another thing that we see. I mean, we've always seen a few, but there's been an awful lot more as of late. Kate McCory. Uh, interesting observation, and I really thank you for that, and that, that's neat to hear. So I suspect that is twofold, and this is, is just sort of an educated guess more than anything, is they may be moving out some of, of some of their traditional areas that have been Fiona affected into the urban areas. Um, but urban areas are actually, for some things that you've mentioned, they're great wildlife habitat, right? There's fewer predators, there's lots of food, there's lots of cover. Um, so they're just finding some really good habitat in around our towns and cities, and hopefully not causing you any trouble. Can I ask one more question? Okay, I'll grant you that, uh, as if it's pertaining to that. Uh. It is just what, what, what do we do? Um, because, I mean, I don't, I don't mind the little rabbits that are hopping around. The neighbors don't like them because they're eating their gardens, but the skunks tend to give me a bit of grief when I let my dogs out. So other than we trap them and, and release them somewhere else, what do we do with all the wildlife that has kind of come into the city? Uh, Kate McCord. Kate, yeah. Um, so there, there's a, a bunch of options for you. The first thing is you want to make your property as least attractive to those animals that you don't want as possible. Um, so if there's if there's compost that they can access, food sources, those sorts of things, seal up any uh, holes that may be, like if you have outbuildings where they might be nesting under, if you don't want them there, be sure those are sealed up. If they're in the area, many of these area uh, animals are sensitive to smells. So things like mothballs or rags soaked in bleach, you can leave them around to deter them uh, from your area as well. Um, and if you, if you have, if, you know, there's a skunk, let's say, nesting, denning in your area, this time of year, I wouldn't recommend this during the breeding season because you don't want to, uh, you know, interfere with the young ones. But this time of year, um, you know, things like even playing loud music and things like that will kind of just make it... <coughs> inhospitable for them. So just uh, think like a skunk or, or a raccoon and think, you know, what can I do to make my property less attractive? Sounds like the neighbors may enjoy you, yeah. Susie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to, uh, I got Brad, Jamie, Carla, Gord, Peter on the list, but Brad, next. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Thank you for coming in to present today. Um, it's great to have you here, and, and uh, Kate, to have a biologist with your experience and knowledge is particularly good. Thank you for your blog, pei-untamed.com, a little plug there. <laughs> if anyone hasn't checked that out, it's, it's an amazing blog. You can learn a lot about our island there. But uh, my question uh, is centers around the FEP program. We had the Woodlot Owners Association in, and they, they are big fans of the Forestry Enhancement Program. They like it a good lot. Here. They've done good things for them. They've been using it a lot for salvage, uh, as you have alluded to. But there's a, um, a little bit of uncertainty out there about whether there's money left that people can you know, apply for or not. Some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. I was wondering if you could, could talk about that uh, a little bit. Okay. Let me say that. Sure. Okay. Uh, Kate McCord, uh, thanks for the question. And, and uh, I'm happy to hear that the program is popular with the Woodlot owners as well. So it, it, uh, it is a great program. Um, so the expenditures have been incredible this year because of the Fiona and the Fiona salvage, uh, and our budget is almost exhausted. Um, the first step for me as director is to look internally and see what options do I have to address that internally, uh, and I'm in the process of doing that right now. Um, what I can say is that I fully recognize that there's a lot more work out there that needs to be done, um, and I want to explore all options that I have to, to help landowners continue to get that work done. Okay, Brad, a little follow-up to that? And yeah, following up on that, so the, uh, the new Hurricane Fiona Forest Recovery Program, which is fantastic. I know my constituents with the smaller woodlots will really be able to use that. Um, I think it has a budget of 1.1 million associated with it. Yep. Are you are you expecting that to be exhausted? And could some of that budget, for example, be used to kind of supplement the budget for the FEP salvage? Okay. 
Uh, Kate McQuarrie, uh, it won't supplement the FEP salvage directly, um, but it will help. So the, the new money that was announced last week is for reopening forestry roads. So that's indirectly a support because we don't have any coverage for roads under FEP. So that's indirectly a support to, to help those landowners continue to access. So we don't have the ability to use the, the new fund for salvage because that work is already covered through existing funds. But things that aren't covered, like those small woodlots and the forestry roads, are options. Um, so yeah. I'm optimistic that contractors are going to be able to continue working in those areas while we take a look at what we may be able to do for salvage. Will you allow me one more, Chair? Make a small one. All right, so it has to do with the, the forestry roads piece. Um, it happened on government-owned roads as well as forestry roads. I mean, obviously people need to use these roads for various reasons. And so a lot of people have just gone in and out of their own volition just cleared them. Some of them, like I said, are, are public roads. And of course, it's really hard for government to give compensation to people after the work's already done because no one was able to confirm what the problem was to begin with and whether the number of amount of time they spent the compensation they're asking for actually matches. So. It's a tough question, and I don't know if there's a way to do it, but um, for people who have already done the work to clear forestry roads and even public roads, and they've invested their own time and money to do that um, because they needed to access them, is there, is there any way to help give them some compensation, even some sort of baseline at all, or have, is that something you've discussed? Is, it, is there anything you want to Norbert Carpenter. Norbert Carpenter. I, I think you may have answered your question. I think that's going to be very difficult to ascertain what was done and how it was done and the scope of what was done. So in terms of going back to offer compensation, I think it would be difficult. Uh, I'm not saying we couldn't consider it. If uh, someone came forth and asked us about it, we could look into it a little deeper, but it, it will be difficult. Okay, you want to go to Jamie Fox and then Carol I want to continue... Uh, back on my, my line of questioning a minute ago. Um, I do understand that there is a risk of bringing in trees from other provinces, and you talked about a couple of the diseases or whatever. Is there a way that we can take advantage of other provinces' seedlings and help assist our nur nursery in getting these trees out into the public's hand or on woodlots? Kate McCoy. Um and I know you're going to be frustrated with this, but there's not an easy answer to that. So trees, trees are one part of a whole chain of production and planting. Um, so I'm reluctant. Uh, I'm always happy to look into options to see what we may be able to do to improve the way that we're doing. I'm hesitant to say that we could accommodate a large influx of out of province right. trees because that's one part in a whole production and value chain. And if you pull one lever, do you have the capacity in the rest of the chain to deal with it? Um, so it's it's a valid question to look into, but I don't think I'm going to be able to answer it for you today. Okay. Follow up, Jay. And with that, it, it boggles my mind when I drive around the province, especially from <coughs> District 19 down to Charlottetown, and you go through the Honorable Peter Bevan Baker's district, and we see the amount of government land that is sitting there unforested. So we go and put these great big highways through. We do improvements on the areas. I'm thinking of try on right now. And there's about five acres of government land that could be forested, but we're not. Why are we not taking advantage of government land and foresting it to the hill instead of letting it sit there as a barren field? Transportation. Barbara Kaepernick. Do you want me to take a step of that, or do you want to? I, I can start soon. OK. Um, it's a, good, it's a good point, um, and, and I'm sure there's, there's some rationale behind why it's not. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, in particular the area you're speaking of, but I do know we are fairly aggressive in trying to reforest properties when we can, and Kate may know the history of why some lands wouldn't be reforested at this point, um, but it probably has implications for another department, most likely transportation. Kate McCrory? Do yeah. you have something you want to yeah, add to Kate McCoury, and uh, I'll, I'll, the only comment that I can make um, is that the lands that, that my division manages, forest cover is a priority for those. So if there's any lands that we manage that are in that category, I want to know about them. Um, the lands in question, are, to my knowledge, are managed by Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll follow up to that chair. Well, okay, okay, after that. <laughs> okay, you're just testing the chair's abilities here. Now. The door was kicked open. <laughs> so there seems to be the bottleneck. Why isn't the Department of Transportation 
on side with the Department of the Environment in helping forest these properties, because that's where exactly the bottleneck is. There seems to be no movement forward from the Department of Transportation in foresting these lands after they do highway projects. And I'm wondering why. Why are we not consulting or why are they not consulting with the Department of the Environment? Robert Carpenter? Uh, I'm not going to smoke and mirrors. I'm relatively new to this position. I know right? that. So, um, and we do have collaboration with that department, probably more so than many. Um, but I, I can take your points back, and the next time we have a meeting, I can discuss that with, with the senior level management at Department of Transportation um, and, and circle back. Thank you. Uh, Carla, and there will be Gordon and Peter you, and Brad. Um, presented to us. Um, so with your presentation and, and kind of seeing the island, um, there's obviously, like you said, lots left to salvage. There's a lot of salvaging left to do. And um, I know that, and there's still programs running to assist people in, in clearing their lots. And then we heard recently that the, um, the debris sites are closing in two weeks' time. Were you consulted on that decision? Do you want to uh, I Norbert Carpenter. I, I don't have knowledge of being consulted on that decision at the deputy's level. I'm not sure if the department did as in general. Um, I, I can't speak for the rest of the department, but not as director level at my division, no. Yeah. Carla, Claire. Thank you, Chair. And, and I guess, do you see that as a problem in, in being able to keep your programs going? And, and is that something that you'll be talking to? Um, tra transportation and infrastructure about to keep these sites open because two I mean two weeks time that only takes us to you know not even November and we there's still time to work before the snow comes so I'm wondering your thoughts on that so for Kate McCory as director in my division that's kind of outside my purview and that the wood that we're salvaging hopefully we're using for products so either it's going into lumber or biomass or some production um, so those debris pits are kind of outside of my purview um, and can you follow up to that? Yeah. Carla Bernard? Were, were you going to say something, Norbert? The only thing I can say, uh, Norbert Carpenter, the only thing I can say is that that's something I can also ask uh, of my colleagues in transportation. Okay, Gordon yeah. McNeely? I had one more question. What? Well, tough. Getting tough. Um, yeah, no, just a few questions on the, the J. Frank Goody Tree Nursery. That's in my district. Um, great place, and they do amazing work. And um, But I notice, like, when I'm, when I'm going on, getting ready for this meeting that that their their landing page was only updated on April 14 2021 that's what it says at the bottom but there's so many programs there's so much change and there seems to be new things on there are we staying current with the information that with all these programs that are starting that 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 are going out to the public that's a that's a great place and I'm gonna put two questions in one is that on there it says you know um, can you buy tree seedlings at the nursery? No. And then it lists the different places where you can buy them. Is there any opportunity to maybe have to promote um, planting and maybe do a day in, in May where people can actually go and, and attend and, and go to the nursery and see what it's like and maybe purchase some things? I'm just thinking about more of an interaction between the public and the, the province and how we're tackling this. Kate McCory. Kate McCory. Um, so thank you for bringing the landing page to my attention. So all of the new programs that we've rolled out have their own individual pages and promotion. It's entirely possible that it hasn't been connected back there. So thank you for bringing that to my attention, and I'll take a look at that. Do you have a follow-up to that? Or? Oh. Yeah, no, the, the, yeah, no, in terms of kind of... Oh, sorry, did you want me to stop there? Or? Well, no, keep going, because yeah. I only get to... It's, it's, it's a <laughs> tough, to, tough place to ask questions here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kate McCory, continuing. Uh, the, uh, so just uh, in terms of interaction with the public, um, we uh, there's always room for improvement, for sure. And, yeah, we can probably do more open houses and those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of school tours, a lot of group tours. Um, just this week, we had the watershed coordinators in for a tour. So we do try to do a lot of community outreach. There has always been concern about direct sales with competition with private nurseries. So that's the main reason that we don't uh, sell direct to the public from the J. Frank Goody Tree Nursery. Uh -huh. Do you have a follow-up to that? Or? Yeah, I understand that um, completely. That's a good answer. And it's just, it's, it's a neat place to, to be and see. We're, we're increasing we're increasing how much we're putting into the forest, and that's good for the future. But are we increasing 
um, the human resources necessary to to get that. That that place produces a lot. It's very busy, and the and the you know the staff there are completely dedicated to this, and they they want to see it. But are we supporting them with enough human resources and enough resources to get to get the job done and where PEI Forest needs to be? Okay, well, Corey, um, our, right now in the nursery, our staff and budget complement are, are good. Um, what worries me uh, is recruit, re retention and recruitment. So, of course, just like any industry, we have folks that are getting close to retirement and replacing those folks, that is something that worries me. Knowledge. Yeah, the, the knowledge that will be lost. So uh, I think we're in a good place right now, and my challenge is to ensure we stay in a good place as that happens. Okay, Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I want to reiterate what Bradley said about uh, Kate's work online and uh, Ask a Naturalist, particularly on Facebook, whether it's woolly bear caterpillars <laughs> or various varieties of dogwoods or whatever it is. It's an incredible source of knowledge, and I personally have gained a lot from that. So thank you, Kate, personally. Thank you. And if you haven't checked it out, uh, Kate's uh, place on Facebook is definitely a wonderful, wonderful spot to learn more about this island and the, the natural habitat here. So thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, and there was a slide in your presentation that, that referred to this, but there wasn't a lot of detail. And it's about that tipping point where our forests cease to be carbon capture and become carbon emitters. And you know, we saw in the forest fires across the country this year how what a what a profound difference that may make to Canada's outlook in terms of uh, our carbon emissions. And I'm wondering if the loss of forest and the deadfall that is down now, um, and the calculations that we made before Fiona regarding our forests as presumably a carbon sink in our calculations, whether that has been updated and if that has a significant impact on our, our zero uh, emission goals. Kate McCorry, um, it's in the process of being updated. So the report that we're coming up out with this fall will have some carbon budget modeling, and for the first time ever, our State of the Forest report has part of that. Okay. Um, and our challenge now is to update that with the information that we're gaining uh, from the post-Fiona analysis. So um, we will have some information on that, and the post-Fiona part is we're working on that now. Do we follow up to that, Peter? So I guess I'm going to have to wait to find out what the answer to that is, because that's, that's a signal could be a significant game changer in terms of our ability to reach our net zero targets. Um, I'm going to move on because our chair is being particularly um, tight this morning tough. on uh, yeah, a tough chair, yeah. uh, unfair chair, I might say. Uh, you mentioned that there were about 1,100 buildings at fire risk as a result of the deadfall in public lands. And you measured, I think, 50 meter zone around the edge of, of public lands. Um, extrapolating that, just using math, uh, probably there are many, many, many more on the edge of private woodlots and private forests. Um, upwards of 10,000 would be my guess if you, again, make a straight extrapolation. I'm assuming no study of that has been done. And my question is, how concerned should islanders be about the increased fire risk? I know you said that we're in a better place now than ever to combat fires, but the but in terms of the risk of fires happening, and we were lucky this year, we really didn't have significant fire damage as opposed to many other provinces, but should we be concerned about the amount of deadfall that has not been salvaged and the proximity to vulnerable buildings? Okay. Uh, Kate McCorry, so to answer the first part of your question, uh, and my apologies if I misspoke, but it wasn't 1,100 buildings at fire risk. It was 1,100 buildings within that 50 meters of public land, and we assessed each of those. So m many of them may not may have had no risk. We went in and, t and took a look, and if there were risks identified, then we took steps to mitigate that. So You didn't misspeak. I misinterpreted. Oh, no, no problem. Um, so just just to clarify that, um, so in terms of you know fire risk is certainly something on on top of people's minds right now, and we're very much aware of that. Um, how concerned am I? Um, it, it's not what's keeping me awake at night right now. So I'm aware of it. Um, I'm confident in our ability to respond. And some important things about Prince Edward Island and how we differ from other jurisdictions is virtually all of our fires are human caused. So we should have some control or, or mitigation around the human behavior that causes those fires. And of course, that's different. The big fires that we see out west and up north, um, some of those may be lightning strikes and those sorts of things. 
The second thing is that our landscape works in our favor. We have a very highly fragmented landscape here, lots of fields, lots of roads, lots of natural fire breaks. So again, those large fires that we saw in other jurisdictions across Canada this summer are unlikely to repeat here because of the nature of our landscape. So is the risk increased following Fiona? Yes, there is an increased fire risk. In my opinion, it's not extremely increased. It's something to be aware of, but not to, to get too anxious about. Um, we need to control our human behavior to be sure that people, when they're burning, that they're burning the right things in the right places at the right times, and the changes in legislation have helped address that. And we do need to ensure that we're prepared to respond, and we've invested very heavily in that in the past few years. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to uh, Brad Trivers, uh, Jamie and Gordon. We wanna try to maybe get this done up in another 10, 15 minutes, so. Better. We're in the short snapper round here now. <laughs> Questions? I think chair. I don't want to disappoint chair. However, uh, so the, the the forestry division. I mean, in really up until now, my understanding is mandate really has been public lands, the way I understand it, and management of our public you know, woodlands. But all, um, the FEP, the Forest Enhancement Program, has really been the way to to reach out to private woodland <coughs> owner, woodlot owners and then help them. And based on your response today, I'm going to continue to tell people to apply to the FAP for both salvage and otherwise. Um, but the, uh, the Woodlot Owners Association has been lobbying, for example, for core funding. They said, can you lobby the government and ask for core funding for us? But by their own admission, they said, we would like to expand our membership as well. Um, it seems to me that then maybe there's an opportunity to expand the, the mandate, we'll say, of the Forestry Division, but also engage more private uh, uh, woodlot owners and again I think in your presentation today you talked about how uh, so much of PEI's land is managed privately and, and we need to engage those but you know there's lots of stats you don't have because that is not, a, there, it's not a tight Remember? engagement today so um, I, I guess my question to you is have you considered working more closely with the Woodlawn Owners Association, expanding their membership, providing them with core funding and using them as a way to reach out to and help uh, partner with private woodland woodlot owners to manage that forestry. Uh, yep, uh, Kate McCord. Um, I, I hope the Woodlot Owners Association would agree that we do work closely with them now. I okay. think we've got a really good working relationship with them. I was in communication with them as recently as yesterday. Um, we share the Woodlot Owners Association and my division share a common goal of increasing sustainable forest management on PEI. And what I can say is anything that we can do to collectively further that goal, I'm open to discussing. Just to follow up, then. okay. Would, would, this is not short snappers now, so yeah. Well, this is a short. Up. So um, better be short. And, and this may be more for the deputy, but are are you uh, considering giving them core funding so they can expand their membership and uh, do a lot of the work with private groups that you'd like to see? Division of Forestry. Uh, Norbert Carpenter. So thanks for the question. Um, it's it's not out of, out of the realm of possibilities. We certainly can uh, have dialogue with with Kate and her team and uh, her connections with the private woodlot owners, fully understanding that financially it's been quite a burden for woodlot owners if they were making uh, revenue from, from uh, the forest. So uh, we understand they are in uh, dire financial shape, some of them, if, if that's the case. And uh, if that wasn't the case and they want to do more uh, you know, uh, progressive things in terms of woodlot management, we certainly could have discussions with them. Jamie Fox. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, one of the issues we we're in here we have to talk about, we have a lot of trees down across the whole province. What are the department's thoughts on if we get heavy snow loads over the next year or so and the impact of that bringing down more trees that have already been damaged and are leaning over and so on? Mm -hmm. Kate uh, Corey. Much of what is going to come down, I think, is down, and this is more of an educated guess. I, I have no data to support that. Um, but since Fiona, I mean, we've had snowstorms, we've had windstorms, we've had other events. Um, trees will always come down. So, you know, if there's a nut, if we get heavy snow in the winter, yes, some more trees will come down. I don't expect it's going to be a, a huge change over what we see on the landscape right now. Okay, okay. Uh, Gord McNeely. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the, uh, the beach grove section, and, and thanks for the work that uh, your team did to organize that and get it out. Uh, um, uh, there was a, 
as a shell, shell time away, when you come in and, and you, you deforest an area that needed to be done, it creates, right in somebody's backyard, it creates a lot of questions, and I, I think I got them all. Yeah. I want to thank your staff for, for, um, for bringing those, uh, talking along the way, but the communication wasn't really there before I found a little bit. Um, can you talk about that section, the communication, and can we... Um, can we improve that going forward with MLAs in the, in, in the province? Because if, if we're moving on to a project like that, and what's coming in that section next? Everything. Okay, well, Corey, so just a point of clarification, you're looking at ways to improve communication uh, when we're doing kind of high-profile work in an MLA's district? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, anything that you would like to see in that communication way, I think we can make happen. I think communication is always really important, and it's always where groups fall down, right? You ask any organization, what's the number one thing you need to improve? Yeah. They're gonna say communication. Um, I hope my staff communicated well on that project because we knew that was going to be oh yeah. good. And if there are best practices from that that you would like to see replicated, I'd love to hear it. And if there are things that we can improve, I'd like to hear that too. And what's going in that set? Like, it's, it's clear cut now. Um, you know, uh, I went over and talked to the guy that was when he was cutting, and, and I asked him because people were saying, "Hey, can you leave this tree? Can you leave that tree?" And so that type of thing. But what is going in that section now? Because that's the question I'm getting. It's it's clear cut now. What, what what's the replacement plan? Yeah, okay, Macquarie. Uh, th that's a very valid question, and unfortunately, I can't answer that right now. Um, there's a, a bunch of discussions going on. Um, when I can answer it, I will. And I'm sorry that I can't today. Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, somebody from Canadian Red Cross coming in, uh, I think, tomorrow to speak to another standing committee on their programs. Um, and that continues to be a source of frustration for many of my constituents, and I suspect constituents of other, particularly those that represent rural areas. And I'm wondering a couple of things. Um, involvement of the department in the, particularly the, the disaster financial assistance program the parameters of that and the changes that have been made and continue to be made to that program even a year after Fiona. Um, and whether you, I'll, no, maybe I'll leave it at that. What, what involvement does the, if any, does your department have in that particular program? To start from the division? Yeah, sure. So, Kate McQuarrie, I can answer from my division's point of view. Uh, my main interaction with the DFAA was with respect to any potential support for woodlot owners. And one of the barriers we ran into early on was a requirement uh, in order to be eligible that you be able to show at least $10,000 in revenue. Of course, managing a woodlot, you don't have annual revenue, right? Your revenue will come in peaks and valleys. Um, and unfortunately, um, and I can't speak to where the lack of flexibility was, but unfortunately there was not flexibility um, to waive that requirement for woodlot owners under the small business stream, which is why they were not, many of them were not eligible for that, um, and why we're hoping that some of the other funding we've put in place will, will help with that. Um, so that was my only direct interaction with DFAA, was around what can we do to help woodlot owners, and I was unsuccessful. Do you follow up to that? Yeah, I do actually, Chair. Go ahead. Peter was, sorry, Kate, I think I may, uh, I may have given you the wrong acronym. It was the Dis Disaster Financial Assistance Plan, the one that was for um, people not necessarily with a woodlot. Um, and the, there were parameters that changed on that. But uh, my question related to that is, you mentioned that the average salvage costs per, I think it was per hectare, was at $1,100. And some of the estimates that have been given from through the DFAP are considerably more than that. Can you explain what the discrepancy would be of the average cost to salvage, in your experience, is $1,100, why it would be, and, and, and I, I say this with confidence, as high as $10,000 per acre? Okay, well, Corey, I sure can, because the $1,140 per hectare was what is through our program, and our program only covers a portion of those costs, so that would be the discrepancy between the incentives we have available and what the actual cost on the ground might be. Thank you for explaining that, Kate. Okay, okay uh, actually, we're kind of coming to the end of my list here, but I have a couple of questions I wanted to add in, so, so we have a few, and I guess as chair, I have that liberty. Uh, one of my issues, and I brought it up to a number of the other groups, was that when it comes to uh, forest woodlots and designations. So in, I don't know if I just look at my own situation. Uh, I had a contract come in and clean up a lot of the stuff, but there's some spots that it's forested woods, but it's deemed wetland. 
contractor, I don't, I'm not taking any chances. And I, as an MLA, I don't want to get into any chances of fines and stuff, too. What are my options in cleaning that woodland up that's designated in the wetland area? I could debate whether that's a, really a wetland or not a wetland, but in the end of the day, the map has a, designated that. And I've got these pockets of a half acre, acre that just blew down. And my other part of that is, what would I do with that if I do harvest it? Can I replant that, or what? And why would I replant it? I guess would be the other thing. So anyway, just to maybe elaborate a bit on designations of wetlands and what what a woodlot <coughs> owner can do to harvest that at some point. We may, may not be able to do it with a contractor. Is there other methods that can be done? Yeah. Uh, Kate McCory, and uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to defer to so, to the per wetland permitting staff in our department. So I don't deal directly with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there have been some amendments to some of the <coughs> wetland and buffer zone provisions to help accommodate recognizing that there is going to need to be um, salvage or work in some of these areas. Um, I, I don't have the details of that with me, um, but our permitting staff would know that. In terms of follow-up, if you were able to harvest and salvage some of those trees, um, the follow-up would be really site-specific. So is there natural generation that's coming back? Maybe right. you don't need to do anything. If there's insufficient natural generation regeneration, maybe replanting would be the right option. Right, okay. Okay, and my other question, and it comes back to you, made the comment about trying to diversify the wood lots and the plantings, and uh, which I, I support in that regard. But one of the things that I found as a woodlot owner is that it's very hard to be viable. It's, you know, the justification of investing in planting trees and getting a return on that in 70, 80 years, I mean, it may not be me, but it'll be somebody in our generation. Uh, there's really not a lot of demand for other than maple. I find that there's some demand for that. So do you take into the economics of, uh, you know, a site-specific spot and saying, okay, this tree will survive or it may not have infestations, but it's not worth anything as an example. So, so uh, how do we, how do you figure that out and, and for your break makeup of what forests uh, should be replanted in? Okay, before mm -hmm. economics is absolutely part of, part of it, and, and I spoke to the importance of the forest industry in the province, and if we're not growing trees that are supporting our industry and our landowners, then what are we doing, right? That, mm -hmm. that is a, an absolutely critical part of what we do, and is part, so uh, under our programs, a management plan is developed that meets the landowner's wishes. So if you're hiring a contractor uh, and a consultant to do your management plan, if economics is at the forefront, then your management plan will reflect that, and the on-the-ground management will reflect that. Um, so yes, economics is part of what we do. Our plans are tailored for the, what the landowner's priorities are, and if economics is your priority, then that's what your plan will reflect. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. So okay, I guess that has we've concluded our list, and I've had my questions asked and answered. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming in and spending the time and taking these questions. And I, even though the chair might have been a little bit uh, hard-nosed in uh, making sure, we, but I think everybody got their questions in in the end, and that was the goal, and we did it within an hour. So, uh, so I want to thank you very much uh, for coming, and uh, we're going to take a small recess as we switch to our second item on the agenda, which is the Renewable Energy Act regulations, and we have uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick coming in. So thank you very much, uh, Kate and, and Norbert. Small recess.
Okay, everybody, I'm going to uh, reconvene and uh, bring our meeting back to order. And uh, the second uh, item on our agenda was a response to the Renewable Energy Act regulations and update on wind farm expansions. And we have with us uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick of the Eastern Kings Rural Municipality. And I think as you uh, probably uh, watched our presentation here earlier there, we just need to make sure, but since you're the only presenter, it's going to be a lot more easier this time. So anyway, we'll start off by uh, asking you to identify yourself and uh, what the rationale of your, who you represent in the organization and uh, what you're presenting on. And you have the, the microphone from that point on. We'll take questions later on. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My name is Larry Fitzpatrick. I'm from the Rural Municipality of Eastern Kings. I'm the Mayor of the Council. Um, I wish to speak with you about the implications of the new legislation, which essentially negates the ability of our Council to manage natural resources in our community. Um, I wasn't sure if this was the correct venue, uh, but I've been invited a couple times to speak. So Council made a decision um, last meeting that we wanted to at least have a voice about the legislation involved and what it does for uh, Councils. <clears throat> So to begin, the rural municipality of Eastern Kings has a population of 650 residents, with many additional seasonal residents in the summertime. The main income is agriculture, farming, uh, fishing, and tourism. Our community is managed for many years by a dedicated community council, which is now called the Municipal Council under the MGA. I'm a first-term mayor, and I have six councillors. Three are newly elected, and three are incumbents. Our community developed an official plan in 2013, which just recently was updated this year by this council and submitted to the minister for approval in September. We believe we have a framework to move our community forward, and our official plan is that framework. We enlisted the help of a consultant to help formulate a multi-land use that will meet the needs of the community in the present and future. We had extensive community consultations through public meetings to canvas what our community wanted for the future. A lot of time and effort was put into the plan by our residents, our consultant, and the municipality itself. We know our community and we feel that we know what is best for the community, but we had the wisdom to utilize an outside resource to learn what other communities were doing and incorporate those ideas if they enhanced our community. We know that a plan is legislated and is a requirement of every municipality in Prince Edward Island. And we take pride in the fact that we formulated a framework for our community to move forward. We did not expect the visions of the Energy Act to override our plan and legislate where windmills could be located. The background on the windmill farm is we've had a windmill farm in Eastern Kings since 2004. And many years later, we learned that there was the expansion of that windmill farm. The Power Corporation applied for an expansion, and in 2021, the Council voted down the application for expansion to the current wind farm. That decision was appealed to Iraq by the Energy Corp. In April 2023 this year, Iraq gave their decision and overturned the Council's decision, but no further information was given to Council. There was no clarification given to the municipality when we asked what Iraq's opinion was, and we were told to get legal advice. As a small uh, municipality, our finances are limited, and legal opinions are expensive. On September 2nd of this year, the amendments to the Renewable Energy Act came into effect, meaning that our community had lost any ability to designate where wind energy resources could locate. Um, <clears throat> I have copies here just for members. It just highlights the two sections that one of our councillors made that's part of the framework and one is section 8 one of the planning act saying every municipality should have a plan and if you don't have one then the, the province can go ahead and implement things then under the energy renewable energy act section 9 one gives the authority for the government to make new legislation and they did with the designation uh, renewable energy designated areas regulation under the new regulations and in that section, they took out or repealed sections that protected a municipality that had developmental bylaws or plan. So in the term of natural resources, uh, rural municipality of Eastern Kings formulated an official plan for their development and use. The plan references green space, shore protection, and development. We're not responsible for natural resources. That's a provincial responsibility. 
So we understand that our community at times falls into the bigger picture of the provincial vision. But it's frustrating to spend time, money on planning, moving forward, and then legislation taking away our vision for our community. The Planning Act of PEI does address issues, and in the section it talks about sustainable plan development, protect natural and built environments, encourage cooperation and coordination of shareholders, address potential land use conflicts. And the Minister's responsibility under the, uh, the Act talks about protect, conservation and management of ecological systems and adaption for climate change are just a few of the responsibilities. The, the Council decision was lined with the purpose of the Planning Act. Yes, wind farms exist, but the expansion of the farm on the industrial scale proposed was not compatible with the community vision that the Council had planned. Our frustration lies in the contradictory provincial legislation of the Planning Act and the Renewable Energy Act. The Planning Act allows our community to manage planning issues without provincial involvement as we have an official plan and bylaws, as stated in Section 8.1. <clears throat> After the Iraq decision, the government used the authority on the Renewable Energy Act, the Section 9.1, to create the designated areas. Again, our small municipality had no information in terms of exactly what did this mean to our community. <clears throat> the Planning Act refers to the government's right to act if there's no official plan, but we've had one since 2013, and now an updated version this year. Our community is concerned with environmental sustainability. That's why we have an official plan. To us, sustainability essentially means meeting our needs without compromising the ability of future generations. When legislation allows action to be built and alter the landscape, we lose sustainability. The future for the property and that community has changed and we can't get it back. We have a great need to do better and the environment is important to all of us. We understand the change is necessary and that taking meaningful action to reduce our impact on the environment. Eastern Kings is not against windmills and agrees that we need to do more in terms of climate responsibility. But how can we in good conscience say that we are acting sustainably when we utilize the natural resources causing irreparable damage to the environment? The Planning Act also refers to the Minister's responsibility of the prevention of fragmentation of land and loss of natural habitat, connect connectivity and biodiversity. The East Point location of the municipality is a natural habitat and is a green belt that must be protected. I would hope this committee and ministers responsible for the respective acts carefully consider the provincial actions, choose a pathway to meet our municipal needs and does not jeopardize the future generations of municipalities. The current regulation enacted does not create a collaborative environment for shareholders involved. If we do, are developing natural resources, then we must make it sustainable in a way that's open and transparent <coughs> to everyone involved that we look at all options in terms of technology and planning to meet our goals, our climate goals. So what we're really saying is municipal council matters and we shouldn't be told where we have to put something. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Fitzpatrick. And I do appreciate uh, the comment and the respect that this is a venue where you should be able to uh, feel comfortable bringing forward your issues and concerns uh, as pertains to anything that deals with government. So, uh, so I'm appreciative that your council has decided to, uh, to actually put, put your statements on the record. So, okay, I'm open for questions. Any question? Peter Bevan Baker. Today, Larry, and thank, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have always been a booster of uh, municipalities having uh, an appropriate level of decision-making authority when it comes to their own um, their their own matters, matters of uh, land use, matters of well, there's a number of municipal things. Here, we're dealing with. Um, a renewable energy project and I'm wondering where the, I'm looking at the Iraq decision here and the towards the end of the of the ruling it talks about the fact that the commit the, the uh, lieutenant governor and council cabinet essentially the um, government um, under the renewable energy act are able to regulate the development of renewable energy projects. And I'm wondering how you feel about the, it's a, it's a really awkward situation as far as I'm concerned, 
to respect the authority and the autonomy of a local municipal government, but also line that up with the authority of government when it comes to approval of renewable energy projects, because that does not lie with the municipality. Can you just talk a little bit about how those two things perhaps don't sit comfortably together? Larry Fitzpatrick? <clears throat> I think the, the issue is, and like I said, Eastern Kings is against renewable energy. And, and, and we're using windmills because that's why I'm here. But if we're talking natural resources, it can be any natural resource in a, in a municipality that all of a sudden is now could be deemed a renewable energy. My, our issue is that we have a very biodiverse area that has a lot of wind. So we want to put the windmills in the area they are in. But we not looking at what the damage we're causing to that environment. So with technology and new, new uses, isn't it possible that we could just move that windmill somewhere further? There's, to me, there's lots of wind in PEI, but does it always have to be in the spot where it shouldn't be because of the environment protection? That's, that's the main concern. I mean, we are not against it, just that if we have something to protect, what, what do we do to replace it? You know, do we take the funds and then and then save it and invest it in 20, 30 years? But it's already gone. Maybe the species are extinct. So what we understand there's a goal and we have to do things. But we're looking at 2023. You have mentioned goals of 2030 and 2040. We're using technology from the 1980s still to do to deal with our climate goals. I'm sure there's things that come along, whether they could be smaller or more efficient maybe don't need high wind speeds of new turbines or but I think even the problem was with the with the council was even if they added a couple that were there in size or smaller scale wouldn't have been the issue it's this, the industrial size that they want to add that's already there it just was not compatible with the, with the community's vision Peter Bevan Baker thank you and I appreciate your answer Larry and one of those um, it's not really a new option but it's something that's being embraced more and more is offshore windmills. And you see that on the east coast of uh, the States and in Europe as well. Um, because there is this ongoing concern about the impact that they have on a local community, in your case, the rural municipality of Eastern Kings. And I'm wondering whether you have spoken to the department or the minister about their appetite to consider um, offshore wind. I realize there are issues with that also, but I'm just wondering whether that's something you've ever spoken to him about. Mayor Fitzpatrick? I haven't spoken directly with the minister, but that was mentioned in one of the public presentations made by the Energy Corp several years ago of the option of, of offshore, because we know what happens elsewhere in the world, and just it was a cost, and that was just the end of that. So we never, I've never spoken directly about offshore or even other kinds of technologies with, with the government about it. But that was an answer I can remember seven years ago that it's very expensive. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Brad Trevor. Do you want sure. back on the list? Yes, please. So, well, thank you, Chair. And, and thank you so much for coming in today and, uh, and for putting your name forward and, uh, and becoming mayor. And uh, it, it's, it's such a, a difficult job and I, I applaud you for that, especially as a, a municipal representative. I say that often. And uh, uh, to me, the, the crux of the matter isn't so much arguing about whether the, the wind turbines are right or not. And I, and I think that's what you're representing. It's, it's, it's the autonomy of a municipal government and the ability to make decisions and, and the ability of the province to override those decisions and, and where that lies. And, and as, a, as a standing committee, when we make recommendations back to the Legislative Assembly, that's where my focus is going to be. Um, now. I wanted to, to quote out of, it's the CBC article, it's quoting from the IRAC, and, and it says here that the IRAC said, the council of the small community, while well-intentioned, had no expertise in dealing with the type of information before them and made no effort to engage any planning experts to assist in their analysis. And then they said that the $18,200 application fee that Eastern Kings accepted from the province could have been used to hire a planner, but instead, quote unquote, nothing was done. So they, they're taking issue with the process. They're saying the process wasn't followed and that the right expertise wasn't involved. And that's why they're overturning the decision. It has nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong to have the wind turbines there. So I, I just wanted to get your input on that because those are, are, are quite
quite the, the, the quotes from, from Iraq, but that's what they're saying. And again, I'm trying to find out at what point we modify the legislation or regulations to allow municipalities and provinces to work together. Um, Mayor Fitzpatrick? Yeah, well, that, if you want to talk, like, I'd rather have not used the word windmills at all in this conversation because really I have no, if you want to use the term, horse in the race regarding windmills. Right. However, when that Iraq decision came down and the way it came down was very unfair to the municipality, in fact, to every rural municipality in PEI. And I haven't given you section numbers, but the Municipal Government Act, the MGA, is a great framework to give structure and, and how to start, but it does not, can't be applied to every municipality in this province. You can't compare a municipality of 500 people to 5,000 to 50,000. So in that statement about a planner and $18,000, well, the $18,000 went to legal fees, which ended up being over $60,000 to the municipality. And to have that expertise, planners are hard to find. So why doesn't the MGA or the government support rural municipalities and say, not for, for every planning uh, subdivision, but when you're developing your official plan, you have use of a planner from the government to help you with your official plan. That would help a rural municipality and, and burden some of the financial costs. It's just that everything involved costs money with the municipality and you're trying to budget. And we don't have any capital assets. We rent our space. We don't have, you know, we've only got two employees. We're very small that way, but every time something comes up, it costs. And then where's that money coming from? So. That's to tell us that we didn't have the expertise, no one said we had to have the expertise. We had this official plan, and the members were going, maybe the, the council, I should say, were maybe not articulate enough to say that an industrial size uh, farm does not, is not compatible with the community. And if we had the money, then I guess we could have had that expertise backed up by an official planner. But that's the whole unfairness of it and where a larger city may have planners on staff and can articulate better because they're there, it's very hard for a municipality to, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a rack, it's, a, it's, it's not actually in a court, but it's like a, a quasi-legal uh, terminology mm -hmm. that uh, it's, it's there and it should be cheaper than an appeals court, but just the lawyers are enough is a great expense to a rural municipality. Mm -hmm. so, do you have a follow-up to that, Brad? Thank, thank you. I really appreciate your response. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Gord on the list. Yeah. And thank you, Chair. Thank and thank you for coming in. And um, it's just, it's funny because the, the Minister of Municipalities was down talking about how he wants to incorporate every municipality. Now we find out that um, the government's ma uh, making municipalities pay money back. And here we're hearing that the government's not listening to municipalities. I mean, it's just, it's baffling about an issue that's this important. Have you reached out, have you, have you had an open discussion with the minister responsible for municipalities about this? This decision to, to go ahead was <coughs> obviously had to do with the minister of environment, changing the mm -hmm. rules and stuff. Have you brought that to the attention of the minister responsible for municipalities? Uh, not to the minister directly, um, but I, just with the federation itself, municipalities to say, where does this stand for rural municipalities, and I'm just waiting to see what they want to formulate with that. Do you have a follow-up to that, Gord? Yeah, so the, regula the regulation changes were on August 24th, obviously, that the minister gave. Um, what was it like as the mayor when you saw those changes come in and started to understand what, what he was doing, and do you think that was directly to get what they wanted to do in the area without consultation? Well, well I'll, I'll be fair, like I had a meeting with Mr. Myers in the beginning of August um, and with the deputy minister and because uh, I wanted to know what was going on because that was totally in their power to do that. They have this section and he was gracious enough to say legislation was coming forward and I said fine um, because really if it would start it right now that you probably get the same vote again with council they wouldn't want the windmills in the current state proposed um, so I knew this legislation was coming and all I asked him was just to let me know and the deputy minister did give me a phone call just prior to the release so I could let the council know that this was coming forward so in one sense it's it's it's, it's an act it's a legislation it's it's a rule it's a government we're, we're following the rules so 
I, I can't, you know, I'm not breaking the law. If a you know, seatbelt law comes out, you comply with the law. But in, in the sense that <clears throat> there's always this option for governments to, to amend acts because hopefully it's the best legislation and then they get a chance to correct it. Unfortunately, we don't see it work the other way. It's when they want to get something, but I don't see anything in the Health Act or Education Act where if something isn't going right, the government will, the minister will put a clause in to say there will be X amount of uh, doctors or a low, lower waiting time and this shall happen. Yeah. It's always the other way when there, there's an objective to get something. I understand there's a lot of money involved, there's been a lot of time wasted, and money's important when it's just sitting around. So the legislation itself was di very disappointing. Mm -hmm. It's just that I thought with the island being so small that maybe the, my first exposure to government would be more collaborative. It's an hour drive to get here today. Sometimes I think it feels when I'm working with government, it's a day away, and I don't know what the other end of the island feels like. It's farther. But uh, <laughs> it just, you know, I'm not talking to Otto, I'm yeah. talking to Absolutely. Charlottetown, and I just thought with the smallness, the uniqueness of, the, of this communities and government that there'd be a lot of things to work together easier. Okay, Peter Bevan Baker. Can answer. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate much of what you said here this morning, Larry. You said something very pertinent and it was around, well, many pertinent things, but one of the things you said was around the, um, the variety of municipalities that we have here on Prince Edward Island um, from, well, I think 500 was the low number that you used, but you know we have municipalities that are far smaller than that. And um, how we're sort of in this gray zone at the moment where the MGA is clearly trying to move the, this province towards island-wide incorporation. And as Gord alluded to just last weekend, the minister made perhaps the most unambiguous comment I've heard from any minister of municipalities regarding that. Now, there was no timeline associated with that. It was just that we want that to be a goal. And I can see that getting us to a place where we have municipalities of sufficient size and capacity and capability to run their own affairs much more autonomously than they do now. And I think you've been caught in this middle area where we're not there yet, and we have pieces of legislation that reflect the prior and current situation where municipalities, simply many of them, do not have the capacity to provide the services and make the decisions on behalf of their constituents. And that makes me very sad, and it's something that I, I've been pushing for a very long time for island-wide incorporation done well, properly consulted, respectfully, you know, the proper, properly done. And when I think about, and I know you don't want to talk about windmills, Larry, and I get that because it's really an example of, of the problem that I hope I've just outlined here. Um, but the experience that Eastern Kings has had with windmills thus far has not necessarily been a positive one. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the arrangement. And I know it's another, it's a different project, Hermanville was done at a different time, different technology in a different community, but in your vicinity. Um, and that's had a, a lot of problems. Um, but I'm, and I'm, I'm not asking you about the technical issues that they have run into there, but what I am interested in is the consultation process and the respect or lack of that was afforded to the folks in that area when that particular wind farm was uh, established and whether you feel that regardless of what happens from now on, do you feel that your community has had um, a sufficiently in-depth dialogue with the minister, with the government, on your concerns regarding the proposed new wind farm? Mayor Fitzpatrick? <clears throat> well, I'll just talk from my, my experience. This has been a very contentious issue in the community. I mean, it's yep. divided new. people, friends, family. Um, in fact, just to get information uh, under the MGA, we couldn't fit our official plan part into the regulars. So we have a special meeting. You know, when people showed up for a special meeting on the official plan because they thought it was involving windmills, and that's where people want information. 
From my experience, and I spoke with Mr. Myers about this at our meeting, was the Energy Corp did a terrible, terrible presentation talking to the community prior to presenting this expansion. Um, they basically talked over the residents. There were some very good questions asked by community members, and they weren't answered properly. And there was just no, like, in my community and your constituents, you have the for and against on each end, and there's a lot of people in between. There's a lot of people in my community that are in between whether when we have windmills or not. I, we need green energy, there's climate change, and then you have the opposed because of their reasons, and then there's the four, which you don't hear, but I mean, they'd be the landowners that would, would get the benefit. But it's these people in the middle, and they're looking for information. And I just said, well, I'm only an hour away, but I've invited, uh, in support of the other group, I invited the Premier or someone. I mean, I don't have the answers, and I'm saying you have the answers, but you probably have more answers than I do. So for someone to come to give a presentation to the public about what does uh, climate goals are, where do we go, What's, what are our energy needs? Like, maybe if people were more informed without trying to find it on the Internet, but someone was giving a thoughtful presentation directly, maybe they'd have a better understanding. And maybe then, it, my, my issue was, it, whether it was legislated or we don't like it, it's happening. At least if we have a better understanding of what's happening, we'll have to accept it. But we get no information, or very little, or it's broken, or it's biased to one side or the other, it, how can you make a rational decision that you want this in your community? So, yes, the, the, I, I explained that the presentations were terrible. And there was just no real follow-up from anyone in the government to explain of why we're doing this, why we need this, where we're going, what 2040 means to net zero, that kind of thing. No one's explained that to the community, or to probably any other community for that matter, on any issue. And I said, we're only an hour away, and, and it would take no time for someone to come out, give us a, present a thoughtful presentation for an hour, and, and take some questions from the community. You know, does that have to be you know, uh, a public meeting in the sense of, you know, we're trying to vote for something, just to share information. That's all we're looking for, is if we have information, then we can make a thoughtful process, and then whether we like it or not in the end, at least we're informed. Uh, do you have a follow-up to that? Peter I do, Becker? actually. Peter uh, for, my first follow-up is to thank you for that very thoughtful yeah. response, Larry, and I, um, I think you articulated very well there, um, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, restrict this to the, any, the discussion on renewable energy or the situation in Eastern Kings, but generally speaking, the level of engagement and true consultation and respectful listening um, is present in many, many issues with this government across departments. So I think this is one, one, just one example of that. But you, you really explained that beautifully, actually, how elected officials understand that there are but there's a bell curve on every issue, and if you have those, in your case, for and against, and, and a number of people in the middle interested in, in wanting to have good information. When you are in a community, and um, windmills tend to bring up the same concerns wherever they are on the planet, um, and one of the, well, there's a couple of sort of fundamental things that have to be done right if a community is going to buy, and, and it's been done really successfully in some places. We, we see some communities that have um, established wind farms that are not only providing them with clean energy, but the, the economic benefit of that is being equitably and usefully distributed within the community, um, and everybody wins. Uh, I'm really concerned that we haven't done the work, we haven't laid the foundation for that to be the case on Prince Edward Island because of the lack of consultation and respect. There's a follow-up question? Yes, mm -hmm. there is. Sorry, Chair. Um, this is not a short snapper, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I apologize. Um, do you have confidence that, again, I'm not, I don't want to prejudge what's going to happen in the future, Larry, but that, that, we're, that you, as the leader of your community and your council, will have further opportunities to discuss with whether it's the Energy Corp or the Minister or somebody else um, and make sure that your A, your concerns are properly heard and B, that the financial benefits of this, and there are potentially considerable financial benefits for a community and we have to weigh that against other things, but that those will be fairly and equitably distributed within your community. Chairperson Patrick. <coughs> 
Well, I just I won't slam just PEI, but I think it's all governments everywhere, provincially, federally. There's a lack of consultation or communication, for sure. Um, you talk about the economic benefits to the community, and moving forward, you would. We, this has been mentioned, but from past experience, um, Eastern Kings has not received any revenue from the windmills since their creation. In uh, they haven't made any revenue. 2007, 2008, there was uh, some energy money given in the tune of 21,000 and 25,000 for those two years. After that, those same amounts were generally received. They're part of our tax assessment, the property tax now. So they're not rev there's no revenue sharing. There's no extra economic benefit. And when I set, talk about a rural community and budget, uh, that's still not a lot to, to manage the government. So moving forward, I, I <coughs> spoke with the uh, CEO of Energy Corp and Mr. Myers and saying, if this is coming in, this is what we need. We, I want to be our community needs to be consulted. We want to know what the next step is. And one of the things we said, I don't know where you are in, in, the, in the plan. I know there was the, the issues with Hermanville and that, but once Eastern Kings is a priority, I want a meeting, public meeting, just to let everybody know what's going on. This is where this is going. This is where this is going. Here's your state. You may fall behind in schedule, but at least people know so they don't panic when every time a backhoe or or a large dump truck drives by, say, well, what's going on? What's being dug up? All we need to do is ask was to be informed. It hasn't happened in the past. What I'm trying to find out, and hopefully moving forward, it will. That's, mm -hmm. that's all we're asking for. Okay. Hilton McLeod? Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for yeah. coming in. Um, I'm not familiar with the area, but when you had talked about um, damage to the environment, what's, what, can you be more specific about what damage? Uh, what they're uh, <clears throat> referring to, and I think the other community groups have spoken, was just about, it's not a farm field in that area, or it's just not a blueberry patch. It's, it's a bit of marsh, bog, wetlands. So there's a, it's a bit more diverse than just a, just a field. So, and the unique uh, migration pattern of, of the birds there, feel, the people feel that the, the windmills would be disruptive, and therefore that that bog, you know, the, which is a, like a carbon sink, could be permanently altered and damaged and, and can't be, even once the windmill's down. I mean, there's clauses in the, in the thing to say, and I don't know what they are, but I know with the individual landowners, there's how, what the recondition will be once they're decommissioned, but after 25 years of being in one spot, you're not going to reclaim the land to what it was. So that's what I meant by, okay. by damage. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up question? Um, has there been an environmental study done on the ground? As far as I, I'm aware, there is. And of course, it, it was <coughs> favorable to go ahead in the area. But they were trying to get variances and, uh, being, and from the municipality, which were, were not accepted, because I think the original number was 11, and now it's 7, because they were too close to the shore. And that's part of our plan about development, because we're losing shoreline, that we yeah. don't want things too close to the shore. So, so yes, I, I, would, I don't know the exact outcome, but I know there was an environmental plan, and obviously it was approved for the windmills yeah. that are there to go ahead, yes. Okay, Jamie Fox. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> uh, thanks for coming in, Kevin. Um, uh, I'm very familiar with the, with the MGA. <laughs> I, I implemented it, or I shouldn't say implemented I administrated it for four years uh, as a minister, but I think in all fairness to the regulations um, and the legislation, I think if I, that the legislation was brought into place 14 years ago and it gave the power specifically to the Ener Energy Corporation to be able to enact that. However, the part that concerns me, you know, we're, we're empowering the Municipal Government Act and the municipalities to do more work themselves and have that capacity to chart their own future, and which I support. But my question is, before the department entered in with this new regulation change, which took powers away from the municipality or limited the powers, was there any consultation with the municipalities or the Federation of Municipalities that you're aware of to say these changes are coming? Mayor Fitzpatrick? No, I'm not aware. Other than the, the, the 
first action of the first mention was the Iraq appeal, saying the government always had the power to do that. Mm. So there was nothing ever to say that uh, that I was aware that they they can do that or they will do that if it didn't go this way or that way. Mm. So, okay, thank you, um, Brad Trivers. Well, well, thank you, Chair, and um, I, I wanted to raise this to you, to you as Chair as well, and and. Uh, I, we're having a lot of discussions about the Municipal Government Act and uh, municipalities and, you know, the interactions with the province, <coughs> and it's not necessarily limited to the, the purview of the Natural Resources Environmental Sustainability, sustainability Scope. Um, I mean, I, I chair Education and Economic Growth Standing Committee, and that's, we're responsible for municipal affairs mm -hmm. there. Um, and I was going to suggest and just get it, maybe, maybe I should be waiting for new business, but that, that we, we perhaps send a letter to that committee uh, asking to get some input um, from our, our great witness here today. That would be a new business um, item. But, but, um, but uh, I don't know if it's a point of order, but I was thinking this discussion today probably should be limited to our purview of our, our standing committee. I just wanted to, to raise that. And not to take away of the, from the excellent uh, um, you know, well, witness. Well, well I'll intervene, Member, saying today. that as chair, we have an open discussion on the whole impact of the windmills, although it does have some uh, impacts on how, how this has transpired into a minister making a decision to say that they're going to over develop regulations that will override what the municipality has decided. So it, it sort of has a combined. So I, I will ask to allow the questions okay. that are pertaining to the, the municipal governance process, but, uh, uh, yeah. so but I, I, you know, the focus is on on windmills and, and uh, what their impacts are on the, you know, the natural resources of our province. So. Well, thank, thank you. I do have a question. Okay, uh, so I'll yeah. grant you a question, Mr. Um, Trivers. Um, so th this has been a, a quite a, a long process, right, uh, when, with the proposal for the, the wind energy project. And uh, I was just wondering, um, in terms of timelines from a council perspective, I know there were elections, uh, when was that, this last fall? Um, um, have you been involved right from the very beginning um, that's right, that's as, as a councillor or as chair? Or, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if maybe there were consultations that were done you know, prior to your involvement. I, I'm just throwing that out there because I know it's been a long process. Um, Mayor Fitzpatrick? Part of it, I, no, I was not involved in any fi official capacity. The only thing I did was attend the public meetings that okay. were presented. And it was such a dark cloud over the community and, and the fact that I was even... Um, uh, deciding if I would run for for mayor, knowing that the Iraq decision was still out there, okay. and so um, all I did at the time prior to was attend the public meetings, and that's from my perspective of what I saw or what was presented. But I don't know of anything uh, the previous council was involved with or councillors. Okay, no, okay, uh, Gordon McDaly. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot. I mean, I, I think you're right to come on, and and, and the way you gracefully talked about. The minister making a decision, even though it's in regulations, to change that, it's to get more power. This, uh, not this standing committee, but another standing committee, we looked at that pretty extensively during COVID. Um, so you have, and, and and then the committee found that that was unnecessary. So you you have a right to come in and talk about that. And you did it gracefully. Um, the, a couple weeks ago, uh, there was another group in talking about this exact same thing. I don't want to get too much into the, but th they said it was a. a a, a grander scale. They had a lot of uh, things that they talked about, and they talked pretty eloquently about the community and about this. Did you have a chance to see that presentation, and, and was there anything that you wanted to add about their presentation, or did you see that at all? Or That's the um, Concerned Citizens. Concerned Citizens. Group, yes. Yes. To. I, I, yes, I saw the letter they submitted. I wrote a letter to the Premier in support of, of some of their points, but expanding basically on the municipal points about uh, the revenue sharing, and my last point about why I'm here today, about not yeah. having any authority. Mm -hmm. So I, I was aware of, of uh, what their purpose is. Yes. Lord McDaley? Yeah, and this is, and I mean, and I'm glad that the former minister for municipalities spoke, because as I'm listening, I'd like to see what, what he would have done if he was the minister of municipalities in this role, because it affects municipalities and I mean he was by all accounts he was he worked hard at his job and this is a situation where the municipalities have have been their their rights have been so maybe he wants to go back on record and say what he would have yeah. done um, 
but my final question to you is that this this committee is going to give recommendations directly to the legislature. So we'll be so the, the the chair will be standing up and reading a report um, to that effect. That that can that that should urge government to to look at different things. And I want to I want to make sure that that we take that very seriously. And as we're getting that ready, so is there anything? Is there anything you would like to see, one or two or three things in there that you would like to make sure that we don't miss out on? Mayor Fitzpatrick? <clears throat> well, I guess just to the MGA itself in, in recognizing the different levels of municipalities and, and <clears throat> like it's a great framework and I understand it's easier, you know, to say about the conflict of interest and, and code of conduct, that's universal. But then there's the other issues of, of trying to, you know, I can't, my municipality can't compete with Charlottetown because I don't provide those services and the finances. So there's got to be a balance there and, and a recognition that, you know, this is the size community can do this, you know, and with the powers they have, but just because it, it all comes down to finances and how they can manage their finances and what service, and a lot of the rural municipalities don't have the big sure. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the MGA would be. Yeah. Uh, important to look at to help custom fit it for PEI and then the Planning Act itself to say what you know what if, if a municipality is required to have a plan then do they have the authority to do what's in that plan mm -hmm. and then again I've mentioned the Energy Act to you know um, I'd rather have a more collaborative discussion of something coming forward to the municipality than having municipality overturned because we didn't have the expertise and the finances to defend ourselves. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you. Larry, you talked a little bit about the environmental impact assessment uh, that, that may have been, or uh, I, can you just tell us again where, where that lies, whether you've had access to see the environmental impact assessment and indeed if one was done. Kind of. Uh, no, I didn't. I haven't had, like, I've seen bits and pieces, but I haven't seen the actual document itself or gone through the document itself. It's been referenced in discussion to meetings, but no, I'm not totally aware of what it, where it stood or what it was for. So, Peter Bevan Baker. And for my own benefit, Larry, and uh, the requirement for a project of, the potential project of this scale, um, would that trigger a potential federal environmental impact assessment, or is this entirely in the hands of the province? Um, that was mentioned, and I didn't get a clear answer on that. Someone referred would a would a federal environmental assessment be needed, but I don't didn't hear any follow up with that at all. So I'm assuming with with if there was the go ahead, those things have already been done or looked at or approved. So. Peter Bevan Baker. Yeah, and I don't know the answer mm -hmm. to that too. That's one of the things I'll mm -hmm. take away from this, Larry, and look into. But the just before you, and you were here when the um, there were a couple of folks from the Department of Environment talking about the, the state of our forests here, and one of the recommendations oh, yeah, no, from the, the Forestry Commission was regarding the biomass. The, 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 uh, this is related, Chair. I'll get there. Um, and one of the recommendations from the Commission is that they recommend that the existing environmental impact is, um, uh, process be amended. Now, I don't know whether that was specifically related to the issue of biomass or whether they're talking about um, amending that EIA process generally to, a, to as it applies to any project, including mm -hmm. something like this. I, I don't. I wouldn't expect you to know that, Larry. But I'm. I'm wondering whether that's something you're aware of, and maybe you do know the answer to that. Uh, no, no. Unfortunately, I don't, and I was not aware of, of any changes like that or what they were referring to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've exhausted my uh, list at the moment. If there's any other questions. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to mention was that. Uh, I, I reside in a small incorporated community as well, it's called Lot 11, and I represent a riding that half of the, the riding is incorporated, the other half is not. I think the one thing that uh, I always sort of see as an advantage of incorporation is the fact that you have say. And I think you've done a really good job of representing your municipality by coming here and representing them by giving us uh, some feedback on, on a particular issue that's important to that community. So, uh, so I just wanted to add that into the, uh, the minutes uh, to say you've done a very uh, eloquent job of doing that, Larry. And 
we wish you all the best uh, in representing your community in future and I hope as legislators we'll come to some sense of consensus on uh, what our recommendations would be but I think that's a, always an important note that our municipalities are there to represent the, the uniqueness of their constituents and uh, provide them some say in, in bigger topics and issues so you've done a good job of that. So if, without further ado unless you have anything more you want to add Larry. Thank you for your time, and uh, we'll have a, a quick recess while Larry leaves, and then we'll get back to our final item on the agenda, which is new business. So, quick recess. Thank you. New business is the next item on the agenda, and I'll, I'll remind members that uh, uh, associate members uh, don't have much say in the voting of uh, agenda items, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, for, is there any items under new business? Uh, Jamie Fox. Vice Chair, um, going back to our first meeting with uh, Norbert and uh, Kate, um, I'd like to have the committee go visit the nursery and uh, see actually what they're doing and how they're doing and meet the people that are out there and and how the the the, the provincial nursery right provincial nursery like we maybe we we take the opportunity and and go out and visit them and see what they're actually doing and stuff like that and now my person i love that idea to be honest but i will say that uh, just what i'm experiencing under the uh, uh, beef plant tour. It's a bit of a nightmare trying to organize these things <laughs> to try to get everybody to attend and uh, uh, And you know, I know myself. I've been there before too, but uh, um, So I guess it's just a matter of what everybody thinks uh, and I might also add our agenda is jam-packed to, yep. to the end It doesn't mean we can't uh, have a tour of the facility at some Sometimes point in, in the future, but uh, any other feedback? Uh, my concerns, uh, okay. Chair. Uh, you know, th things are really busy now. We're only a few weeks away from this. I don't imagine you meant tomorrow, uh, mm. to be fair. Uh, but I, I could certainly consider it for the spring, Chair. Yeah. So, okay, maybe I'll, based on that, we'll say we'll add it to our work plan uh, with a date in future. And uh, maybe, but uh, Alicia, you can reach out just to say, yeah. would they be accepting of a tour? And what's a good time of year to do that? Yeah. Okay. Any other items on a new business, Bradley? Trevor's? So as I was saying earlier in the meeting, um, I think a lot of the discussion today from the witness centered around municipal affairs, the MGA, and how the province works with rural municipalities. And uh, I, as chair of uh, Education and Economic Growth, I, I think that committee could receive a, a letter from this committee just saying we had a witness in, these were some of the issues they raised. You might want to consider inviting them in at that committee. That's, that's what okay. I'm what, what does everybody think on that? Uh, uh, Gordon McKayley? I think it's a great idea. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, we just had municipalities in um, to that committee, if I recall, or the, the, the association. 
Um, so a letter would be a good start, and maybe even addressing some of the concerns that that they brought forward, and you know, particularly in that letter. But I don't know if we would just reach out to one municipality or or Mr. Duke. I, I, I guess my only point on this would be is that. Uh, couldn't that committee itself identify that uh, you sit on it, I sit on it, we could always bring it up at that point uh, versus our committee or myself as chair writing you to say that uh, we, you should bring them in. I, I, I guess, like I say, you're, you were right in saying that there was some, you know, we were deviating over into uh, some of the issues of another committee, but I felt that uh, as chair, the reality was is that the questions were pertaining to a bigger project that were pertaining to the municipality, and there was concerned citizens of that municipality to which this mayor represented. So I was maybe a little lax in passing on you know, some of the components of the Municipal Government Act, but I think we still kept it in focus to, to the premise of the project and the windmills. But so, I, I, like I say, if somebody wants to make a motion that's not an associate member to uh, write a letter, I'm happy to entertain that. Can I just okay, Alicia has a, some points to make. Um, just a suggestion in, to streamline the process. Maybe the letter could be to um, our presenter itself to say if you have any um, feedback on matters relating to the NGA or land use planning to forward them on to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic mm -hmm. Growth specifically to kind of just speed up the process and it, and just eliminate some letters um, to just reach out to him directly and say those points can go to this committee so that they can be immediately considered for the upcoming report. So we seem to have a lot of nods that say that that would be a favorable process. And you, yeah, there you go. Okay, so we will have Alicia draft up a letter to the municipality to uh, suggest some of those uh, components uh, to them. And, and, and I think also, Ed, thank them for the relevant mm -hmm. presentation that they made in representing their municipality. Any other new business items? Hearing none, uh, I will seek an adjournment. Anybody? Adjourned by Jamie Foxx.